continued study of Swinburne's book, The Coherence of Theism. Today we'll be discussing chapter 6 on attitude theories. So in this lecture we're going to begin with some background on non-cognitivist approaches to religious discourse. We'll also talk a little bit about non-cognitivist approaches to ethics. We'll continue to talk in more detail about R.B. Brightweight's non-cognitivist views about religion, specifically in his very well-known article and then book, An Empiricist View of Religious Discourse. And then we'll continue by discussing language games and religious discourse, looking a bit at the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein concerning his remarks on religion and his central notion of a language game, and then looking at D.Z. Phillips' work throughout the mid and later part of the 20th century, filling out a position known as Wittgensteinian fideism. So let's start with some background on non-cognitivist approaches to religious discourse. Non-cognitivist approaches to both ethical and religious discourse were very much in vogue in the middle part of the 20th century. They're still very much a live position, you know, especially in ethics. So what I want to do is I want to start off with just a just an overview of non-cognitivist views and how they're applied to religion, and then look at some motivations for it. Non-cognitivism is a kind of irrealism about a subject, for example, ethics. So the view in ethics would hold that ethical statements aren't in the business of describing reality. They aren't subject to empirical investigation, observation, in some sense that you would go out and discover whether or not an ethical statement is true. Non-cognitivist views applied to religion right, make very similar claims. They say that religion isn't in the business of making statements about the world which could be true or false in any substantive sense. So for a non-cognitivist view, one misunderstands religious practice and religious statements if one is in some sense engaged in a process or a procedure or an inquiry of trying to gather evidence for particular religious beliefs. Another commitment to non-cognitivism about religious discourse says that when people utter religious sentences, they are not typically expressing states of mind which are beliefs or which are cognitive in the way that beliefs are. Rather, they are expressing non-cognitive attitudes more similar to desires, approval, or disapproval. So in the description, I will link to a Stanford Encyclopedia article on moral cognitivism versus non-cognitivism read around that article, you know, to get a sense of how the non-cognitivist versus cognitive, cognitivist debate works. So why be a non-cognitivist at all? What motivates non-cognitivism? And here I have a portrait of David Hume, and basically the idea is, like, if you want to explore the motivations for non-cognitivism, become acquainted with Hume's philosophy. I think it's fair to say that non-cognitivism about morals and more generally about discourse really develops out of Hume's philosophy. So the first motivation for non-cognitivism is naturalism. This is the view that says that every fact that there is is a physical fact or a natural fact. There's no odd, weird facts, like moral facts that exist somehow or another not in the physical world. There are no angels. There's no supernatural substances. There are not ghosts or gremlins and so on. Naturalism is normally tied with an exalted view of the natural sciences and can be tied with a kind of exaltation of science, saying that the method of science is the method we have for discovering the empirical world. Rather, the method of science is the method we have for discovering everything about reality. So if you're a naturalist, right, then moral facts are going to be odd kinds of facts. They're going to be facts that you can't find out in the world. You can't go out in the world and somehow or another locate the fact that it's wrong to torture anyone to gain information. Another motivation for non-cognitivism is worries about what it is for a religious system, or you might say a moral system too, to be brutally correct and others to be false. So the idea here is that it can seem puzzling to think that one particular religious tradition is the true tradition and all the others are the false tradition. That doesn't seem fair in a way to the sociological facts and the ethical facts that are contained within that system. And so there are words here that are related to the idea that a kind of notion of objectivity that we might apply to scientific theories, it doesn't work 
uh, in the case of religious theories. Another motivation for non-cognitivism is specifically about religion. There can be difficulties with understanding how religious claims can be confirmed or disconfirmed. If you were to go to one of your local religious organizations, you're not going to find people ordinarily that are investigating whether or not these claims are true, that are engaged in some kind of project where they're gaining evidence for the religious claims. This third motivation says that it just seems odd, right, to think about religious claims in the perspective of something like scientific inquiry. Another motivation is one that also comes from Hume is this distinction that Hume has between facts and values. The fact-value distinction is hugely controversial. The basic idea is that there's some fundamental difference between facts in the world and the values that we have. That it's, it's like an oil and water. The two right, are completely different kinds of things. A final motivation that I want to give for non-cognitivism is how religious facts fit with stances and motivations. So if you are a religious person, you have particular commitments and you have particular motivations. And these stances and motivations don't seem to fit very well with a simple-minded view of the facts. I mean, there, there are plenty of facts out there in the world that don't connect at all to one's stances and motivations. That there's a bell tower in the quad of, the UA's, main, of UA's main campus doesn't seem to give me any kind of motivation or stance. It's just a fact. The idea here is that there's something special about motiv moral and religious motivation and stances that just seem not to fit well with, you know, simple views of just facts in the world. One influential kind of non-cognitivist view applied to religious assertions was developed by R.B. Brightwaith. So Brightwaith has a well-known book and appears as view of the nature of religious belief. In that book, he says that a religious assertion is the assertion of an intention to carry out a certain behavior policy. So note that a religious assertion isn't a statement about the world that can be true or false, that is answerable in some sense or another, to the way the world is. Rather, a religious assertion is something about an individual's attitude. It is an assertion of an intention to carry out a certain behavior policy, subsumable under a sufficiently general principle to be a moral one, together with the implicit or explicit statement, but not the assertion of certain stories. So there are two questions you could ask about this claim that Bartwood makes. The first thing is to note that it presupposes a distinction between a religious assertion and a non-religious assertion. So he says a religious assertion. That implies that there's a difference between a scientific assertion, a historical assertion, or you know, some mundane assertion. So you might ask, how many kinds of assertions are there? And what are the criteria to individuate between assertions? In particular, what's the difference between a religious assertion and a non-religious assertion? So we'll come back to this later. And so consider a non-religious assertion that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Caesar crossed the Rubicon in January of 49 BC, which precipitated the Roman Civil War and ultimately led to Caesar's becoming dictator and the rise of the imperial era of Rome. Caesar was a governor at that time. And as his rule or term as the governor, governor ended, the Roman Senate ordered Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome. He was explicitly ordered not to take his army across the Rubicon River, which was at that time a northern boundary of Italy. In January of 49 BC, Caesar brought the 13th Legion across the river, which the Roman government considered insurrection and treason and a declaration of war in the Roman Senate. So this is a very significant historical event, but it's an ordinary fact. It's a fact that there was a particular person who crossed a boundary that was of political significance. Compare that to the religious claim that Jesus rose from the dead. This claim is probably the most significant claim to a miracle in any of the major religions, but it is also a claim about, on the face of it, a historical event, that there was this person that was put to death and then rose from the dead several days later. So a question for Brightwaite's view is if we consider those assertions, how do we 
separate the one from the other, saying that the one is a historical fact or historical assertion that has great political and world significance, then the other is a religious assertion that isn't a, an assertion about a historical fact, even though something about the nature of the, the religious assertion has great religious significance. So a second question that we can ask of Brightwith is the one that Swinburne asked, is what kind of behavior policy is invoked here? And, and let's look at what Swinburne says there on page 93. So Swinburne is quoting here from Brightwaite. Swinburne writes to, at the outset, he says, we find out what kind of behavior is associated with the stories of religion by, quoting from Brightwaite, asking the religious person questions and by seeing how he behaves. I myself take the typical meaning of the body of Christian assertions as being given by their proclaiming intention to follow an agapeist way of life and for a description of this way of life, a description in general and metaphorical terms, but in an empirical description nevertheless. I should quote most of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So Swinburne remarks, to simplify crudely, but not, I think, unfairly, the meaning of the statement, there is an omnipotent, omniscient spirit who cares for humans, is just the statement that I commit myself to showing great consideration for humans. So what does Swinburne have to say against Brightwaite's views? So he acknowledges that creedal statements are tied to behavior. So they're tied to motivations and they're tied to stances. But he notes correctly that this doesn't exhaust their meaning. Rich Swinburne says it certainly looks like creedal statements or statements about the world. Consider, for example, the Four Noble Truths. So I have here in a picture the first noble truth that life means suffering. So note what it says here. It says to live means to suffer because the human nature is not perfect and neither is the world we live in. During our lifetime, we inevitably have to endure physical suffering, such as pain, sickness, injury, tiredness, old age, and eventually death. And we have to endure psychological suffering, like sadness, fear, frustration, disappointment, and depression. Although there are different degrees of suffering, and there are also positive experiences in life that we perceive as the opposite of suffering, such as ease, comfort and happiness. Life in its totality is imperfect and incomplete because our world is subject to impermanence. This means we are never able to keep permanently what we strive for. And just as happy moments pass by, we ourselves and our loved ones will pass away one day too. So that certainly has religious significance, but yet it also makes claims about what it's what it is to be a human person and what being a human person and what conditions human persons experience. Another point that is worth making and it's made by Swinburne is that Brightweight's specific views are tied to the verificationist criterion of meaning, which is a bad view of how statements acquire their meaning. Remember in an earlier lecture, we pointed out that there's a difference between a statement having truth conditions and one being able to recognize when those truth conditions obtain. Here I want to point to an article that I think is, is a superb article. It's written by Hilary Putnam. It's called Brains and Behavior. And Putnam there is criticizing a behaviorist view of mental states. And one of the things that he points out is that at root, the behaviorist view, while it is tied to a verificationist criterion of meaning, that ultimately stems from an incorrect view of confirmation. And he makes the point that once we have a correct view of confirmation, confirmation has to do with explanation and probability, not certainty, then the grip that a verificationist view may have on certain individuals is loose. Swinburne next turns to talk about language games, which are developed by a very influential philosopher in the first part of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein. I want to point out here, there's an excellent biography written by Wittgenstein by Ray Muck. It's Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius. I read it in my early 20s. It was a, I really enjoyed it. it it's, an, it's an excellent biography. So if you're at all interested in in learning more about Wittgenstein, but more generally just history of philosophy and, and reading about a fascinating character. I mean, Wittgenstein was definitely a fascinating character. 
uh, you know, I definitely encourage you to read this. From my recollection, you know, it's about 350 pages, but it's a very good read. They read pretty quick. So Wittgenstein didn't write about religious belief. I mean, what we have are remarks that he makes about religion. We have a collection of lectures and conversations that span aesthetics, psychology, and religious belief. I happen to have a copy of this. It's it's a very it's a very short book, so it runs 72 pages in total. So here are some quotes that Wittgenstein gave about religious belief. I mean, you can you can look this up on the internet. Lots of these quotes can be found on various websites that are devoted to putting quotes up. So Wittgenstein says, at one point, to believe in God means to understand the question about the meaning of life. To believe in God means to see that the facts of the world are not the end of the matter. To believe in God means to see that life has meaning. In a different context, he says, if you and I are to live religious lives, it mustn't be that we talk a lot about religion, but that our manner of life is different. It is my belief that only if you try to be helpful to other people, will you in the end find your way to God. So we're not really interested in developing Wittgenstein's views on religion. I have my doubts whether there's anything like a consistent view of religion in his remarks. What is more influential is his work on philosophy of language, and in particular, his fruitful concept of a language game. So let's look at what Swinburne has to say about language games and then see how they are developed in the context of religion. So Swinburne writes a language game is a certain kind of discourse. A language game may be a very simple kind of language, such as a language in which there are a few simple commands that are given and obeyed, or it may be a segment of a complicated language, as for example, giving orders and obeying them, describing the appearance of an object, or giving its measurements, constructing an object from a description, drawing, reporting an event, speculating about an event, forming or testing a hypothesis, presenting the results of an experiment in talks and diagrams, making up a story and reading it, play acting, and so on. So that's a quote that comes from Wittgenstein's book, Philosophical Investigations. And then Swinburne continues to write, he says, to study a language game is to study how and when the different sentences of a discourse are uttered, in which circumstances, in response to which other sentences. So one idea that becomes associated with language games is to think that language doesn't have a core purpose, a fact-stating purpose, for example. Language has multiple purposes depending on how it's used. And we can study language as the study of correct moves in a language game. So when someone says such and such, then an appropriate response to that is to say so and so. And then applied to religion, the idea is that we can study religious discourse, or we can study religious sentences as appropriate moves in a language game, where this opens up the possibility that religious statements don't have as their function to state facts, rather they have as their function some sort of social function, as appropriate responses to one another. You might think of this as a complex liturgy, and the liturgy isn't like a scientific discourse, it's rather a ritual procedure. When such and such say such and such. When this happens, then you do this. So the study of how religion can be a language game has as its central advocate a philosopher of religion known as D.Z. Phillips. So D.Z. Phillips was a very influential philosopher of religion. He ended his career as a professor at Claremont Graduate School in California. He was born in 1934 and passed away in 2006. He has a great name, Dewey Zephaniah Phillips, so I don't know why people called him DZ when you could call him Dewey Zephaniah. I mean, a name like that is just worth, you know, saying Dewey Zephaniah Phillips every time you can say that. So if y'all want to give your kids a really cool name, I think Dewey Zephaniah is, you know, the way to go. So Dewey Zephaniah was a student of Rush Rees. You can Google Rush Rees. He was a very uh, well-known student of Wittgenstein. He, um, he edited a lot of Wittgenstein's work after Wittgenstein died, and he's responsible for a lot of the writings and lectures and conversations we have of Wittgenstein. So Dewey is known for his particular approach to religion, which is known as Wittgensteinian fideism. One of his famous books is The Concept of Prayer, which is pictured here, and Swinburne talks about that book in some detail. So let's look at this passage from Swinburne where he's talking about Dewey Zephaniah Phillips' view. See, isn't it much better to say Dewey Zephaniah? So Swinburne writes, 
However, writers such as Dewey Zephaniah have written on the religious language game as an activity in which religious people indulge that has no logical connections with any other language game. Assertions of the religious language game do not, in their view, entail assertions of any other language game, and conversely. The religious language game certainly presupposes the occurrence of certain mundane events, such as birth and death describable in non-religious terms, in which religion finds a meaning. But it does not predict such events, nor does their occurrence entail its truth, nor does any weaker relation, such as making probable, hold between assertions of the two disciplines. To understand what religious utterances, such as creedal sentences, mean, one must study when and where they are uttered and the point of uttering them. Other writers, Dewey Zephaniah writes, have assumed too readily that words such as existence, love, will, are used in the same way of God as they're used of human beings, animate and inanimate objects. But he claims the criteria of the meaningfulness of religious concepts are to be found within religion itself. The language game of religion, like that of science or history, is played. What can be said that God loves this and hates that, hears these prayers and forgives those sins, cannot be determined by arguments that use the criteria of other disciplines. Religious discourse has its own criteria, which determine what can be said. So then Phillips applies this view to prayer, and he says that here's how we should understand prayer in the context of religion. When deep religious believers pray for something, they're not so much asking God to bring this about, but in a way telling him the strength of their desires. In prayers of confession and in prayers of petition, the believer is trying to find a meaning and a hope that would deliver him from the elements in his life which threaten to destroy it. So I just want to point out another passage that Swinburne quotes from Dewey Zephaniah's work. So, he, so here Phillips is saying, the love of God is manifested in the believer's relationship to people and things. In this sense, he can be said to have a love of the world. To see the world as God's world would primarily be to possess this love. To say that God created the world would not be to put forward a theory, hypothesis, or explanation of the world. So this is Wittgensteinian fideism as a kind of non-cognitivism. It's a very sophisticated kind of non-cognitivism. So if you're interested in this, I'd encourage you to go read some of D.Z. Phillips' books, and I can help you locate some ones that I think will be particularly helpful for your study of how religious language is used, I think of you. So the key claim, the key implication of Dewey Zephaniah Phillips' view here is that creedal sentences do not conflict with any other discipline, that they have their own criteria for the appropriateness of use. And so for this, I want to look at two case studies. So the first case I want to look at is the case of the Four Noble Truths for Buddhist views. So this lays at the foundation of a Buddhist philosophy. The first noble truth is that dukkha, which means suffering, pain, and inability to find permanent, satisfying existence. Dukkha is an innate characteristic of existence in the realm of samsara. The realm of samsara is the realm of birth and rebirth and death, this, the circular aspect of, of birth, death, and rebirth. And the first noble truth is saying that life is suffering. The second noble truth is that the origin of this dukkha, of this suffering, is desire, tanha, craving, desire, or attachment. The third noble truth is that the cessation of this dukkha can be attained by the renouncement or the letting go of desire. And the fourth noble truth is that the noble eightfold path is the path that will lead you to the cessation of dukkha by the renouncement of time or desire. Two core doctrines to Buddhism are known as anatman, the impermanence of the self, and the truth of interdependent arising. That basically the way I think about it is everything is, is connected and it's in a way a um, it's in a way like a, a giant ocean of interconnection that one thing rises up and then becomes another thing. This process goes on and on and on. Part of the renouncement of desire and then the cessation of suffering is to realize that this desire we have, that things stay the same, is an illusion, is a deep illusion. And then our ignorance of the inner dependent arising of everything leads also to suffering. 
But both of these claims I want to point out are metaphysical claims. They're claims about the nature of the world. And in fact, there are robust and vigorous discussions in the Indian subcontinent over the truth of whether or not all reality is impermanent and whether or not interdependent arising is true or not. And basically what you have is you have two, this is a very simplistic picture, but you have two schools of thoughts. One associated with various branches of Buddhism and one associated with various branches of Hinduism that are engaged in very long debate over whether or not these claims are true. So this fits poorly with D.Z. Phillips' account of religion is not making claims about the world. In this particular context, it seems apt that Buddhists think these deep metaphysical truths about the world have religious significance. And if you try to conceive of Buddhism without making claims about the world, then what you get is you get an ethical system that doesn't seem to have the same profundity as this more realist understanding of Buddhism. So the second case study I want to look at for Dewey Zephaniah Phillips' feediest account of religious statements is to look at the central miracle in Christianity. So... If you look at the religious texts themselves, they are rather explicit about the importance of a realist understanding of this miracle. So this is a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here it says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So the context with this particular letter, it's a letter to the Corinthian church. And there is evidently a debate about whether or not the dead, you know, ordinary people that, that lived in the, the town of Corinth, if, if when they died, they would then be raised later. And there was a particular group of people that were saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And so the writer here of Corinthians is saying, look, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if that's true, then what we're telling you in our religious discourse and our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And then the writer continues, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and so on. And then the writer continues, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most pitied. And so the writer there is pointing out that if one were to take a view that there's no resurrection of the dead, then this would undermine these central claims that they have been making and the central religious practices that they have been engaged in. So note that Wittgensteinian fideism implies that Jesus' resurrection does not conflict with any claim in any other discourse. So it wouldn't conflict with the biological claim that every person is mortal. So I'll let you make of that what you will. But it does seem accurate at least to say that if you look at the religious texts themselves, the most accurate reading of those religious texts is that they are viewed as making claims about the way the world is that very well may conflict with other investigations. So next week, we will turn to look at the divine attributes and we'll begin with omnipresence, looking at some of the challenges, the a priori challenges to understanding and thinking about the logical possibility that a being is omnipresent.